I want to thank you for tuning in to this worship service. Thank you so much for taking the time to dig into God's word with us. Here at Highview, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. And we'd love to invite you to come out to one of our services at one of our campuses. But we'd also love to, for you to check out Highview at highview.org. May you be blessed by our Lord as you dig into his word to know and follow Jesus. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn me to John chapter 14. It is once again a privilege to be walking through the gospel of John and our Lord just revealing himself, leading us to himself so that we may believe. Here we come to John chapter 14 and within it contains some of the sweetest and greatest promises that our Lord has ever revealed to us. For many of you in this room, this is an incredibly special passage, as it should be. And as a preacher, I'm like, Lord, may I do justice to this passage. If you can't preach John 14, I don't know if you're supposed to be a preacher. I mean, like, this is like, there's so much incredible things that are being just revealed to us in this scripture. And it comes in the midst of difficulty. It comes in the midst of trials and tribulations that our Lord speaks out of his heart. If you know the context, you know that a series of events are unfolding quickly. We are in the upper room. It is Thursday evening. We know that on Friday, Friday evening, he will be upon the cross. John is recording strategically the very last words of our Lord. Why? Because they are for us. He is speaking to us with an urgency and with a clarity that we will not be fooled. That which unfolds, he's already told about. He knows what he's about to do, but he's also placing within us a clearness of him and a clearness of what is to come so that we and our faith is strengthened. So in the honor of God's word, if you're able and willing Let's dig into John 14. We're actually gonna begin with the end of 13, verse number 36, and we'll go through 14, one through six. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, with great humility, we come before you and your word. And Lord, we know that you are pouring out upon us the fullness of who you are and your great promises. Lord, may we receive fully your goodness and your grace and your mercy the inheritance that you want to bestow upon us. Lord, may we have our eyes open and our hearts clear. And Lord Jesus, may we truly know you, knowing that, Lord, you step in to our very trouble to deliver us. Father, do a mighty work here this morning. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing we discover in this passage, and it's clear, trouble, trouble is real. Trouble exists, 
And the trouble that's happening here in the midst of Judas in his betrayal, the trouble with Peter giving a prediction of his denial, knowing that Jesus has told them he's about to go away, there's about to be a separation. Trouble has entered in and that trouble has taken up residence within their heart. That's where anxiety and trouble, that's where they find their place. There's a heaviness upon us. We can have somewhat of a pleasant exterior, but there are times when things are going on inside that are absolutely wrecking us. That's where trouble has found its residence and it finds its residence for several different reasons. For Peter, it was about personal failure. It was about this proclamation, Lord, where are you going? Lord, I will go with you anywhere. I will follow you. I will lay my life down for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, will you lay down your life for me? Peter, before the crow, crow, crow roosters or crows or whatever it does, where the rooster crows, man, that, I'm so glad I didn't eat biscuits and gravy. Can you imagine what I'd be saying if I ate that? But before that rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Could you imagine that weight? Could you imagine that trouble that Jesus was now weighing upon him. Man, I'm, I'm gonna betray you, Jesus? I'm gonna deny you? Like there's a trouble that is real. Grief is real. Sorrow is real. There's a separation. And that grief that is now begin to grow. Jesus addresses, he comes right in. He says, let not your hearts be troubled in verse number one. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Our Lord knows what's happening. He knows what we're struggling with. He enters into that struggle and he calls us to himself. Believe in God. That's an infinitive. That's a truth. That means that that's a fact that they do believe in God. They want to be with the Lord. And he says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. That's an imperative. That's a command. Believe also in me. He's calling them to himself. He's calling them to faith. Man, James Montgomery Boyce defines faith this way. I've given it to you a couple times, but I think it's key. He says faith. Faith in the, in the Bible, faith is grounded in God and is something that springs from his encounter with the individual. True faith is receiving these promises and believing them on the basis of God's character. Faith happens first and foremost when we meet Jesus. The Lord initiates the relationship. He's come for us. He opens up a way for us to himself. And there's an encounter, an encounter that changes us. We're brought to faith. We're brought into a relationship with him. That's number one. But that faith grows. That believing grows when we trust in his character. We trust in him. We trust in his perfection. We trust in his word. And he's about to bestow great promises upon us that are based upon his character. Faith happens when we meet the Lord and the faith grows when we depend upon him and his character. In the midst of trouble, our Lord is saying, stop depending upon yourself and depend upon me. Faith is an antidote to worry. It's an antidote to our trouble because our Lord is greater. And he wants us to know his greatness. He wants us to know the hope. That doesn't mean that trouble doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that trouble immediately goes away. It means that we enter into it, not by ourselves, and we enter into trouble with an eternal hope. It changes the way that we see trouble. It changes the way that we treat it. It changes the way we live because we know we have him. And in the midst of this trouble, he calls us to himself. And then he begins to reveal these incredible promises. Take a look at verse number two. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now, this is one of the great promises and these are things that we begin to latch onto, we begin to dream about. Because in your King James Version, it says that in my father's house, there are many mansions. And we get really excited about that. Like, am I the only person, maybe Alice and I are the only people that just go and we drive around different neighborhoods and we start looking at homes and we like, my goodness, can you believe that house? I mean, like, 
who lives there? I mean, like, those, that's incredible. And we drive in these incredible streets. And then you can go on YouTube and you get a little picture behind them. And you can see all the amazing homes that people live in. And you're like, my, I didn't even know that was possible. Like, that is incredible. I mean, like, the amazing mansions. And we start to begin dreaming about our mansion. Well, the scripture is a little clearer on what it's trying to communicate here. It's not necessarily talking about a mansion that is separated from our father. It's about being in his home. Now, it may be a mansion, but it's on his property. It's in his presence. We belong to the Lord. We belong to the Father. And he is saying he has a place for us. Here's what I do know. If we as man can make the most amazing homes in the world, architecturally, they're gorgeous. How much better can the creator of the world make something that's amazing? It's gonna be so much greater. But there's a tendency in this passage to latch on to the place so much that we actually forget that it's the person who changes us. It's the relationship. We're brought into the Father's presence. We're brought into his home as his child. Because I know if you're like me, you've been in some of these magnificent homes. You've walked in and I mean, you've been blown away by like amazingness around you. But also you are witnessing dysfunction of relationships. I've been behind some of these closed doors. And I can tell you right now, there may be beauty on the outside, but there's great darkness on the inside. Not so at the Father's house. Father's house is perfect. There's no more sin. There's no more grief. There's no more death. We walk into the Father's house and there is him in all of his perfections. And I'm telling you, in the light of his glory and his grace, we are not thinking about the architecture. We're thinking about him. We are called to him. He's the one that is glorified. He is the one that is majestic. And there comes a moment when he wants to bestow upon his children all of his goodness and his grace. What is he saying to us? I'm making a place for you. I'm designing it. I'm making it. I'm getting it ready for you. I want to welcome you in. Remember in this passage, he's already addressed him as his little children. We belong to him. He wants to bestow upon us all his goodness, his grace, his majesty, his riches, and his, our inheritance upon us. That's why I read from Ephesians chapter 1. And there's a great scene in Revelation chapter 3 with the church of Sardis. At the end, it talks about the Lord writing their name in the Lamb's book of life and never to blot it out. And then he says that he's going to confess our name before the Father and before the angels of heaven. I want you to think about this for a moment. There is going to come a time. Those of you who belong to the Lord Jesus, you've placed your faith in him. There is going to come a moment when we pass from this life to the next, to a place that is better. It exists. It is real. It's eternal. And we get to enter into it. And we get to enter into the presence of our Lord. There is going to come a moment that we are going to be before him in the throne room of heaven, before our Father, before myriads and myriads of angels. And our Lord Jesus is going to confess our name before him. He is going to say, this, he is mine. This is my child. This is my brother. Uh, he stood for me. He confessed me and I'm confessing his name before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It does not get any better than that. I mean, feel that. Know that that's real. Know that these promises are real because it's based upon his character. And he's saying, I wouldn't tell you that this is true if it was not true. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And it's going to be amazing. It's incredible. And then he says in verse number four, and you know the way to where I'm going. And then thank goodness for Thomas, right? Thomas, Thomas gets a bad rap, but I'm telling you right now, every one of us would ask the exact same question. Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is 
the sixth I am. If we've been walking through the Gospel of John, we've been meeting various I am's, taking us all the way back. That's taking us all the way back to Exodus chapter three, where the Lord gave to Moses his covenant name. That's what Jesus is saying. I am that I am. He's using that covenant name and he's giving a clarity of revelation about who he really is. And so this is the sixth one where there's a seventh one in, in uh, John chapter 15. But here he says, I am God in the flesh. He's fully God, fully man, God in the flesh. And he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is making a very exclusive claim of salvation. There is no other name under heaven by given to men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. He is the only savior. He is the only redeemer. He is the only one who can open up for us the way to the Father. No one else. And some would say, God, that sounds arrogant. God, that sounds narrow-minded which once again shows us how arrogant and narrow-minded we are because we don't fully understand that which actually keeps us from him. It's not about GPS directions. It is about sin. There is no way to the Father. There is no way for us to earn. There's no way for us to make ourselves holy. We by nature are children of wrath. We are sinners. It's by God's grace and mercy that Jesus has come for us to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the perfect Lamb of God that takes upon our own punishment, our punishment that we deserve. He took upon the wrath of God for us. He became that propitiation. He took upon the wrath of God so that he could extend to us mercy. There must have been the shedding of blood for there to be the forgiveness of sin. And not just any blood, but the blood of a perfect sacrifice himself. He came to willingly lay down his life for you and me. And how, how crazy, how audacious is it for us to complain about God when we can honestly say, Lord, I'm so thankful that there is a way. You've made a way for us to us because without you, We are all lost and dead in our sin and destined to an eternity in hell apart from you. But of his goodness and his grace, he is the way. He has opened up the dividing wall. There's now an opportunity. There's an invitation for any person in this room to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, to confess, meaning that there's a declaration that Jesus is Lord, that we believe in our heart, that God raised him from the dead, the resurrection is true. And we now, the scripture says, you will be saved. I mean, what an incredible gift that none of us deserve. And the Lord, he is the way but he's also the truth. Take a look at verse number seven. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? You still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me, this key, has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe? that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do speak, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. He is the way and he is the truth, fullness of truth, that when you see Jesus, you see the Father in perfection. You see all that the characteristics and attributes of the Father is displayed in and through Christ. He is the truth. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's a person. It's not an idea. It is a person who is the truth who now sets us free. And he asks us over and over again in this passage, do you believe in me? Do you believe? I am the way. I am the truth. And over and over again, he's saying, do you believe? Will you trust me? And if you don't trust my word, trust the evidence, Philip. 
Trust all that you've seen. You've seen water turn into wine. You've seen me feed the thousands. You've seen me heal over and over. You've seen me raise Lazarus from the dead. Philip, believe. Believe that I am the truth. Believe that what I say is true because there's a clarity of my authority and there's a clarity of the evidence. He is the way. He is the truth. He's also the life. Take a look at verse number 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the newness of life. This is what it looks like to walk with Jesus, that we are not left in our old life. No, life has become new and no greater illustration of this than in Peter. Peter is about to deny Christ three different times, of which he does. He's then restored by Jesus in John chapter 21. And then the Lord places the Holy Spirit upon him in Acts chapter two. And in Acts chapter three, he's asking things in the name of Jesus and a, and a man who's lame from birth all of a sudden walks and he preaches a sermon and over 3,000 people get saved. Greater works. Greater works in the name of Jesus, in the power of Jesus. There's a newness of life by the Holy Spirit of which we are going to meet in great intimacy here coming in the next few chapters in the book of John. But our Lord, he is. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Do you believe him? Do you trust him? Because trouble is real. Life is difficult. Grief is real. Suffering is real. Our hearts carry trouble. Will we turn to the Lord? Will we allow faith to truly be an antidote to carrying unnecessary burdens and truly experiencing the hope of Christ? Because I want to bring you back to one promise that I have not addressed yet. Come back to me in verse number three. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Listen to this. I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. That is one of the greatest news right there. Why? Because it's not dependent upon our own ability and strength, because we're limited. Here our Lord Jesus is proclaiming that he's gonna come again. There's going to be a second coming. He is going to come again, and he is going to usher us into his perfect presence. He is going to come and to get us. I learned this. I learned this valuable truth in a very tangible way in this world in the December of 1997. I'm taking you way back for some of you. I'm going all the way back, and there was a time when Alice and I were just newly married. We was, I was pastoring a church called Long Ridge Baptist Church in Owenton, Kentucky, and we were trying to get home for Christmas. But unfortunately, a major ice storm was on its way to Arkansas, and you guys know what happens with ice in the South. It's not a good situation because they don't know what to do. So <laughs> that's what's happening. And so we were like trying to get out the door. We were trying to get on our way. And so we loaded up the dogs. We loaded up everything in this little Honda Accord. And we were trying to make our way to Memphis because Allison's brother lived in Memphis. If we could get there, we could spend the night and then we could get up and go the next morning. And we get to Memphis and her brother had already bailed. He already went back home to Hot Springs. And so we, we stayed there in Memphis that evening. And then we got up the next morning and the place was just covered in ice everywhere. But we were like, we gotta make, we gotta try to get home. And so we, we just got on the roads and the Memphis roads were actually not that bad until we hit that Arkansas border. There's a road called I-40 from Little Rock to Memphis. It's normally about a two hour drive, but that two hour drive from Memphis to Little Rock took us eight hours. And we had two big dogs in the back. One dog was in heat. The other dog was fixed and didn't know it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was like, it was Armageddon, right? I mean, like, like, get off of her, right? Like, it was like, all fog, the windows were all fogged up. It was just terrible. But we're driving for like eight hours, man. I mean, struggling, trying to dodge all these semis. I mean, it's slip and slide all over the place. 
And I mean, I was driving, you know, with white knuckles for eight hours and you're just worn out. And we finally made it to the outskirts of Little Rock and found this best Western that in that moment turned into the Ritz Carlton for me. I mean, like it was like the greatest hotel of all time. But we got into this hotel exhausted, but deflated because the roads are like, how are we going to get home? Allison, how are we going to get home? I, I don't know. I, I don't think the Honda Accord's going to make it home. I don't know if we're going to make it home for Christmas. I don't know what to do. Then Allison calls her dad. And her dad, Jack Porter, may be the most outdoorsman person I've ever met in my life. This guy, he, he's, just, he's just a survivor, right? And he says, I'm going to get to you. And I just knew in my heart of hearts, if my father can get to me, I can get home. And man, that, that next glorious morning when I saw him pull up, I knew, I knew with confidence we can get home. Your heavenly father is so much greater than any earthly father. And he's promised to you, I'm gonna get you home. It's not dependent upon your strength, it's not dependent upon your greatness. It's not dependent upon your ingenuity. It's dependent upon him. And he has promised us he's gonna come get us. And he's gonna usher us into his great kingdom that is an eternal one, that is perfect. But these promises belong to his children. Do you belong to him? Are you his child? We know from earthly experience, we love to buy our children things. We love to bestow upon them that which we can. We love to surprise them with goodness. Just like you're gonna surprise me next Sunday because it's my birthday, right? No, really, it is my birthday next Sunday. <laughs> Feel free. But like, like <laughs> my wife's gonna kill me. But we love to bestow upon each other surprises, goodness. How much more does your heavenly father want to bestow goodness on you? He wants to wrap his arms around you. He wants to remind you, you belong to him. He wants to remind you, I am not making a place for you. I'm going to come get you. You're going to be with me. Those relationships are going to be right and good and precious. He's going to heal all wounds. He's going to totally change us. Forever. And we get to be with him. But do you belong to him? Because this passage is essentially about faith. Believe. You believe in God. Jesus says, believe also in me. Do you believe in him? Honestly, are you fully dependent upon him and him alone for your salvation? When someone says, why are you saved? You say, because Jesus saved me. He paid my price. I believed in his promises. I've surrendered to him. He is my Lord and Savior. That's how we know we are saved. Do you know him? And if you do know him, let the Lord increase your faith this morning, no matter what you're going through. Let him increase your faith. Let him encourage you. Let him show you just how much he loves you you. Pray with me this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your great promises. Lord Jesus, thank you. You are, without a doubt, you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. No one, we can come to you by no one. No one comes to the Father except through you. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed this morning, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I mean, you surrendered your life to him. You've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, as it says in the scripture. If you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth, that's, that's a declaration of allegiance and loyalty, a declaration of faith. You confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The scripture says in Romans 10, 9, you will be saved. Believing is more than intellectual belief. It is an actual surrender of your life to the Lord where you now are a follower and you are looking to obey him, follow him. My prayer is if you don't have a relationship with Lord Jesus, none of these promises belong to you. 
But the Lord is initiating a relationship. He's calling you to himself. Will you surrender to him? For those of us who have surrendered to the Lord Jesus, man, where's your faith? Where is it? The Lord wants to strengthen you today. He wants to remind you who he is. He wants to remind you of his great promises. He wants to remind you he's already won. And he wants you to live in his victory. Cast your cares upon him. Let him minister to you right now in this moment. Let him ease those burdens. Let him remind you that you are not alone. Let him remind you he's coming for you. And he's going to walk you into his perfect presence. He's coming and he loves you. Lord Jesus, strengthen us this morning. Encourage us, change us. May we live life new in you. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.